So this is the class two set materials. And we're going to start by um, just reviewing some of the stuff we went through in class one. So this will be repetitive in terms of some of the content that we went through um, earlier here before I started the recording, but I'll just kind of blow through the slides for, uh, for completeness. Okay, so remember, um, you should be picking up on the whole step one, two, three repetition now, right? So those three steps are premised around the objectives of, of ASC 740. So first, we're trying to figure out our payable. The second thing we're trying to do is figure out the movement and deferreds. And then the third balancing item that comes out of it will be the provision. Okay? So if you can remember that the first two steps are the main objective of ASC 740, we're in good shape. So just like we were scribbling freehand a few minutes ago, um, I want you to think about the flow of journal entries in the same left to right, top to bottom sort of way. So if you figure out the, the current payable first, and then you figure out the deferred tax next, and then let the provision fall out to balance an entry, um, that, that's the sequence I want you to, to take. Okay. All right. So... <clears throat> When we went through the solution to the homework, you might have seen that when the question was book the entry for the current liability and book the entry for the deferred taxes, it was separate. So instead of one big combined journal entry like I've been teaching you with step one, two, three, you can look at each step as its own journal entry. So step one could have a current liability offset with a current expense, which is what... Um, Hold on a second, let me make this disappear. It's probably driving me crazy anyways. So you can look at this step one. You can look at this as step one and think, when I credit my liability if I'm profitable, the other side of the entry is current expense. And then when you go to step two, and you, <clears throat> you see I have... a change in my deferred, so let's say I have an increase in my deferred assets, the other side of that entry will be deferred expense. So remember that some of those um, items, those temp items I was talking to you about, which would have the effect of increasing your payable, will increase your current expense. But as they create a deferred asset because you're going to get a future deduction, because it's a timing item, your deferred expense will go down, right? This entry is going to be um, debit expense credit payable for a temp item, or sorry, for, uh, yeah, for a temp item. And this entry would be debit DTA credit expense, right? And as I shortcut it, all I'm doing is I'm getting rid of the two expense items and trying to show you that it's simply a debit to DTA and a credit to payable for a temp item. Right? It's just a balance sheet reclass between those two. But if you were breaking this out into individual entries, you would look at your current separate from your deferred separate from this thing, which we'll learn later in class, about a uh, company's reserves. What they hope they don't have to pay, but they might ultimately have to pay if they get audited. Okay? <clears throat> okay, so basic concepts. <clears throat> right? This is matching. All these all these words here. I mean, we're trying to match our tax expense with our uh, book income. Okay, so we're not worried about how much tax we're paying now. We're worried about how much tax we're ever going to pay on our pre-tax profits. So when I ask you how to make sense of a provision in a problem, right, you go through all the steps and all the journal entries and you come out with a provision expense. If I say, why does that provision expense make sense? Your answer should be that that's the tax that's all the tax we'll ever pay on that pre-tax profit, okay? That's the answer. And 
more importantly, you, you should be able to reconcile why that would be true if all the temporary items were reversed. Okay, so we talked in class one a little bit about doing your provision by jurisdiction. For the first few classes, we're only going to be dealing with one jurisdiction. But um, I can't remember when we introduced the concept of states. But when we introduced that concept, keep in mind that the federal tax system is a separate jurisdiction from the state tax system. Okay? So some people just think it's all U.S. But, I mean, ask Eugene from his California days. They think themselves pretty independently of the IRS, I'm pretty sure. <clears throat> um, your current tax provision your current tax provision is the, is the uh, other side of the entry from the liability that you accrue for current year taxable income and your deferred tax provision is your change in deferred tax assets or liabilities so as your DTAs go up there's a provision benefit, right, because you debit DTA and you credit provision. And if your DTAs go down and you're going to credit your DTA and debit expense or debit deferred provision. And for the most part, as we go through examples, I'm going to bypass the current and deferred expense piece, just like I've been doing um, before we kind of hit the set materials here. I'm just going to call it provision. I'm just trying to streamline it and make it easier. But one of the reasons why this current and deferred provision is important is if we go back to this slide, when we go over the um, homework, eventually we'll hit... Um, the homework where we talked about the Disney 10K, you'll be able to see this separate from this in their 10K. Okay, that's doing that. And so, even though it's nice to understand what their total provision is, it's kind of interesting to also know well, how much of that provision are they paying in taxes now, and how much of that provision are they paying in taxes in the future, right? Like, how significant are temporary items for them? Or are they like Nordstrom's, where they just pay their tax on a pretty current basis, right? Yeah. So that's where this becomes relevant. Okay, terminology. So in slide nine, there's a list of, of a bunch of terms. Okay, and so since I've learned tonight that you guys are not good about reading, <laughs> one of the things that we might do is we might have ourselves a little pop quiz where some of these terms I ask you to define, okay? And um, if we do that kind of thing, I'll, I'll let you open your notes or whatever, but I'm only going to give you like five minutes to do it. So you kind of have to know what you're doing. Okay? So read up, know these terms. If, if you get to class four and you can't explain what a deferred asset is, you're in trouble. That is not good. Okay? You need to be able to quickly explain what a deferred tax asset is, what a deferred liability is, what a temp is compared to a perm. Um, okay, so if you think of these terms on the sheet, you're going to need to know what these are. Okay, conveniently, starting on slide 10, all those terms are defined. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so we've already explained the current provision and the deferred provision, which are on the left. And the UTB on the right, we're going to deal with in a later class. Our total tax provision, right? Remember that this is the tax expense that we have now because of the tax liability we're going to pay currently plus the deferred expense related to taxes we'll either pay or save in the future. Total tax expense. Okay? So it is the total tax that we expect to pay related to income in this year's financial statements. Okay, So if we take the income in our financials, our profit, we want to know what the total tax is that we would ever expect to pay on that profit. Okay. Return to accrual adjustment. So as I said in the 
very, very beginning of class. Um, this is uh, the third quarter for calendar year companies, and so they're working through return to accrual differences. Okay. So a return to accrual difference is this. It's the comparison of the book tax differences that you've anticipated at the provision versus what you ultimately reflected on your return. So let's say that at the provision, you expected an add back for fines of $10. But then the compliance team comes along and does the tax return and lo and behold, the fines are $12. Okay. So the return to accrual difference, or the return to accrual adjustment using the terminology in the slide, is two. Okay. So if a company had that return to accrual difference with their return, they would book a journal entry based on this. And so we're going to learn about that a little bit later in this class. But if you went back to the format we've been following and said payable deferred taxes provision, if the only thing that happened in year two was I realized the 10 add back on my provision was wrong and it should have been 12, well, that means that the payable I had before was wrong and should be higher. I need more payable. Just assume I have a 100% tax rate. That fine's never going to be deductible, so it's not a temp item. So I need to increase my provision by two. So when I identify the fact that my provision was wrong, I thought I had an add back of 10, but because I really had an add back of 12, I have to deal with the fact that I have two more of an add back. And by dealing with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to accrue more payable because I'm going to pay more tax than I thought. And because I'm going to pay more tax permanently, my provision goes up compared to what I thought. Okay? So this would be a simple journal entry for a true up. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so if, you were the, if your provision and return were exactly the same, except for this one penalty difference, this entry right here would be your return to provision journal entry. Okay? Obviously, the goal is to have as small of differences as you can, because when their differences are big, people wonder why you didn't get it right the first time. Yeah. Do you have to explain the true ups? Yeah, you have to explain the true ups. So, in this example, I mean, we'll get to this a little bit later, but in this example, um, if you went to your boss, right, if if Kuwait is doing the provision and she's like, hey, we got two more of expense, and her boss is going to be like, what? That's crazy. I didn't know we were going to have two more of expense. Nobody told me that. Like, I didn't tell my boss we were going to have two more of expense. And he's already told the, the investment banks what the earnings are going to be. So if you're telling me we have two more of expense, then the earnings I told the banks isn't the right earnings. And so one of us is in trouble, right? And stuff, you know, stuff goes downhill, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you don't want to you don't want to return to a cruel difference where there's a provision expense that surprises people. Right? Usually, you don't want any return to a cruel differences because anything that's a correction means that there must have been an error, and having there been an error is not fun. But everyone has return to a cruel differences. This is a fact of life. Okay. All right, Kay, this one's kind of for you. So deferred assets and deferred liabilities. DTA, okay? The A means it's an asset. means it is a future reduction in tax. It is a good guy. Future deduction. Think NOL carryover. Okay? DTA. So if you see a balance sheet for a company and it has DTAs, that means in the future they're going to save money because they have these things for tax that are going to allow them to create deductions. Deferred tax liability, right? 
the L is for increase in tax. Okay. And so, in comparison to what will happen in the future for book purposes, if we have more taxable income or we have less tax deductions, then we have a deferred tax liability. Right? So if you look at a company's financial statements and they have deferred tax liabilities, you should think, oh, well, this isn't good, because if they turn their balance sheet to cash, right, if their balance sheet was converted to cash at book value, then they would owe tax, okay? Right, because those deferred tax liabilities mean that the tax basis you have in your assets is less than the book basis. So if you converted that book basis to cash, you would have taxable income. You'd have a gain. And that deferred liability is there to reflect that. Okay? <clears throat> okay, so I think tonight if we go through... Um, Exercise one, we'll show you how to do your first rate reconciliation. That's fun. You're going to do a lot of those in class. Um, and when you get to the conclusion that it doesn't work, if you, if you say my rate rec doesn't work, it means you did it wrong. Okay? There's a, it always works. It's just you didn't get it to work right. Okay? <clears throat> so I'll explain what that means in a little bit. Okay, in fact, now we are going to pause, and we're going to do in-class exercise number one, which I have on the screen here. So this, this will look similar to the um, homework problem that we went through. Okay, and so you can see the facts on the page. And here's what I want you to do. So this is going to be a common theme in class. So I want you to work with the person next to you. And I realize there's people on both sides of you. So figure out how to pair up. And um, if it's more than two, if it's three, that's fine. I want you to work together and come up with the provision for, um, for this problem. Okay. So I want you to book the journal entries. And um, you can see what the questions are in the, in the problem themselves. But what I really want to know Wait, hold on, you guys are preoccupied with pairing up. <laughs> what I really want to know is what's the total provision, what's the effective rate, and for all you brown nosers out there, if you, want to do an, if you want to do a rate reconciliation, if you know what that means, if you finish fast, do that. And if you don't know what that is, you might not finish fast, then we'll be fine. Okay? All right, so I'm going to give you like 10 or so minutes to work on this and work with your neighbor. And if, if you're completely stumped and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing, raise your hand. And then one of the three of us, Quinn or Anna or me, will come help you. Okay, so we're going to do the solution to the in-class exercise. Okay? All right. So the way I'm going to do it is the first step I'm going to take is I'm going to calculate my payable. I'm going to do my step one over here. Okay. So I had PBT of $100,000 and now I'm going to go through my perms and my temps. Okay, my perm items, I had meals and entertainment of 5000 So I'm going to add back half of that. And by the way, it helps me to be right when I have the answers in front of me too. But, um, so the meals and entertainment is an add back of 2500 And the other permanent difference on here is I have tax-exempt interest. Okay, and that's 8000 and that's a good guy. Okay, it looks like that's all the permanent items that I have. So as far as my temporary items go, I'm going to put a P next to the meals and entertainment and the interest to 
designate that those are perm items. So if I go to my temporary items, tax depreciation exceeded book by $10,000. So I'll say depreciation 10,000 and that is a good guy. And that's a temp. This company uh, recorded um, prepaid insurance of 2000 So some of you are asking, what does that mean? When you prepay insurance, depending on what method you're on, if you're on a advantageous method, you would deduct that when paid. So even though the book guys expense that over the term covered by the insurance, the tax guys can deduct it when paid. So when I said it was prepaid and it increased, that was kind of the cue for we paid something, so let's deduct it. Okay. And my last temporary item is I have a bad debt reserve increasing by $7,000. So bad debt, 7000 And because the balance is increasing, that means that the book guys are expensing something, but I can't deduct it yet. Okay. So if I take... Those permanent, permanent and temporary differences, I should get taxable income of $89,500. And my tax rate is 40%, which means my tax is $35,800. Okay? So I owe taxes of thirty-five thousand eight hundred. You good with that? Okay. Step two. So step two was figuring out my changes in deferred taxes. All right. So. If I look at my temporary items, my temporary items are those three things. Right? So let's make sure we got the direction right, because this is the most confusing part of this, if you ask me. So in our current calculation, our depreciation was $10,000 of tax depreciation that exceeded book. So what will happen in the future? Are we going to have a future good guy or a future bad guy? Bad guy, right? If we took tax depreciation over a book this year, that means next year we're going to have book depreciation over tax. Right? So it's going to reverse on us. So that's, that's going to create a DTL or reverse a DTA, depending on how you look at it. Insurance. If we took a tax deduction right when we paid the insurance contract, what's going to happen next year? Books is going to expense that asset. They're going to say over the 12-month contract for the insurance, they're going to expense it. The tax already deducted it. So we're not going to get a future deduction to match the future book expense. So that's a future bad guy. Bad debt reserve. So we're accruing 7000 now. We added it back in our current calc. And in the future, when those accounts receivable are written off, we'll get a deduction. So that's a future good guy. Right? So the first two are future bad guys, meaning we're, we're building DTLs or we're reversing DTAs, one of the two. And the third one is a good guy. We're building a DTA. So the net of those is 5,000. And that is a net bad guy. So we have to credit our deferred taxes because in the future, the net of those three things means we're going to owe more tax in the future compared to what book income will show. Yes. So we're going to credit our deferred taxes.
by 5,000 times 40 percent or two thousand dollars okay so we've credited our payable for 35 8 right that was step one we credited our payable now we're crediting our deferred taxes so our total provision is going to be 37,800. Okay? All right. So when you look at a company's 10K and you see the company describe their current expense, then that first table, when you look at a company's 10K, you'll see current provision. It'll say 35.8 of expense. When you look at the next part of that same table, it'll show you what the deferred expense is. In this example, it's two grand. And this will be our total provision. So if you were looking at a company and said, oh, they have 37,800 of provision and 35 of its current and two of its deferred, what that means is of their total expense, they're paying most of it now and they'll pay a little in the future. Right? But in total, the tax that they'll ever pay on that hundred thousand of profits is thirty seven thousand eight hundred yeah all right did anyone figure out how to do the rate reconciliation and want to brag about it Kuei? okay so Kuei figured it out okay so let's explain since we're hitting this for the first time, let's explain what we're doing. I'll explain it. Um, unless you want to explain it. So, okay, so we just calculated our provision of 37,800. And our effective tax rate is 37.8%, right? 37,800 divided by 100,000. So if somebody says, hey, your tax rate is 37.8, but you're a U.S. corporation, your tax rate is only 35%. So why is... Why is the rate you're telling me, your effective rate, your 37.8, why is that different than 35? Right? Tell me why the statutory rate is not your effective rate. What is going on? So the rate reconciliation is meant to bridge that gap. So when you look at a company's 10K, in the second table in the footnote, usually it's the second table, they'll have a rate reconciliation. And it is meant to tell you, the reader, why whatever the company's effective rate is, is not their statutory rate. We're trying to explain what the difference is. Okay. So, as Kuwait is about to start telling us, we're going to start with our expected provision. And then we're going to get to our actual provision. And I'm going to do this in dollar terms, but the way the guidance works, you can disclose this in either dollars or percentages. Okay, but let's do dollars first, since we just did dollars in the calculation of the, of the problem. Okay. All right, so our expected provision. Kuwait, what would be our expected provision? 40,000. 40, oh, yeah, I confused you by saying our rate was 35. Okay, so if our statutory rate was 40%, we would expect a provision on 100,000 of profits to be 40,000. Okay, and our actual provision was 37,800, right? So the point of our rec rate reconciliation should be able to explain why those two numbers are different. Okay, so why are they different? Go away. Meals and entertainment. So meals and entertainment, the fact that we had meals and entertainment caused our provision to differ from the statutory rate, right? Okay, and so how did that affect our provision? By 1,000. Okay, so we had a $2,500 add back times our 40% rate. So our tax actually went up by 1,000 beyond what the 40,000 we would have started expecting. It went up by 1,000 because we had permanently non-deductible meals, right? Right? 
Okay, so now we're up to 41,000. This is not good. We're getting farther away from the answer. Then we have tax exempt interest. Okay. So we have 8,000 of tax exempt interest. So at a 40% rate, we actually saved $3,200 of interest. Right? So if you add up the 40, the 1,000, and the 3,200 going the other way, you should get 37.8. Okay. So when I was on this page, this is, bless you, this was basically those three columns, right? Step one is the payable, step two is the defer, the provision falls out. Now this rate reconciliation is just taking that provision I calculated and reconciling it back to the statutory rate. Okay, so I think Catherine's asking about, are we showing these amounts a net of tax? So here we calculated our tax liability using the tax rate. Here we calculated our future good guys and bad guys at the tax rate. So we said in the future these timing differences will flip, and if we multiply that by 40%, that'll be the future tax effect. So that means this balancing entry implicitly is a tax affected number. You can you can do it either way. And this is and this is both confusing, but also I do it both ways like this to show you you can do it either way. Whatever makes sense to you. Like if what I just did, kind of calculating step one all together, step two all together, and then letting the provision come out, if that works for you, that's the fast way to do it. That's how real provisions are done. This way. If you're like, boy, I'm stuck, I don't understand it, and I want to go journal entry by journal entry with every fact, then do that. It just takes longer. And if you had 210 differences and 100 perm items, then you can imagine you'd be sitting there for a long time writing out journal entries, right? But that's okay. We're not going to have that kind of volume. So however it works for you to process the debits and credits, that's fine for right now. Okay. Okay. So from this rate reconciliation, what should you have taken away from this? Permanent items impact the tax rate, right? This goes back to our family feud problem in the first night. Right? The question was, what items impact your effective rate? The answers were all different kinds of permanent items. So when you look in this rate reconciliation, the whole purpose of the rate reconciliation is to explain why did your effective rate go up or down? Perm items. So when you're looking at a company's rate reconciliation, you should expect to see perm items in there. Okay? And the more complicated rate recs that we look at, the more you'll see weird things that'll make you wonder. But trust me, there'll be some permanent aspect to them because of the three steps, one side of the entry is payable or deferred, and the other side is provision. And usually when you have a scenario like that, there's something that is permanent in nature. Okay? I'm not saying it can't affect deferreds because it, it, it can, but for the moment, perm items. Okay, what's the other thing you should have taken away from that example? You should sit next to Kauai in next class. That's what you should do. She knows how to do a rate rack. Okay. So what will happen commonly, just to kind of get ahead of this, is you'll do the rate rack, and let's say that you, um, let's say you get the sign wrong, and you put 3,200 in here, 
right? And so then you calculated 44,200. But on the prior page, you calculated 37,8. This will happen to you. And you'll be like, my rate rack doesn't work, right? It's broken. <laughs> and so the answer is you did it wrong. You got one of the signs going the wrong way, okay? And there's not that many variables in this example, so it's not that hard to spot if you got a sign wrong, right? But if you added like 12 jurisdictions and 30 perms and a whole bunch of other numbers, then all of a sudden you can't find it anymore, right? Because the volume masks like what you did wrong. So the practical reality of this is when you do the rate rack, there's not just two simple items that click into place, right? There's a lot of things moving. So it's very common to then do this rate reconciliation and not get the same number you just computed before. But the answer is they have to be the same. And it's really dealing with the same data set. It's just presenting it differently. That's all it is. Right? But trust me, I've spent many, many hours just trying to fix a rate rack that doesn't work. Okay, that's the problem. Questions on the problem? It doesn't matter. Maybe you misunderstood whether something was permanent or temp. If, if you didn't realize the Meals Entertainment was a perm item and you left it out of your rate rack, it's not going to work. Right? You get the sign wrong, you don't tax affect it, lots of things can go wrong. You can imagine how hard it is to grade your exams when there are problems like this because you guys are creative with all the directions that you take. <laughs> we try not to grade based on right and wrong. Um, okay, any other questions on the problem? Yeah, so now's question was about the prepaid insurance. <coughs> So with the prepaid insurance, <clears throat> the way the prepaid insurance should work is when the company enters into a contract, it will debit prepaid, let's say it's for $120, credit cash for $120. So it goes to its insurance broker and says, here's $120. I want insurance for a month, or for 12 months. So the first thing they do is they book this. The second thing they do, which they book monthly, is they will debit expense and credit the prepaid for 10 monthly. Okay? So you will get a tax deduction when you pay the insurance, but when this book expense rolls through, you will not get a tax deduction. Okay? That's how prepaid insurance works. Good? Yeah? No? So when I claim this tax deduction, I would debit my tax payable. But because I know in the future when the book expense comes in, I'm not going to get a tax deduction. And this guy's free anytime tonight. Call him at midnight. I'll give you his phone number. I'll credit DTLs. Because I'm going to have a future bad guy when there's this future 10 of expense, I won't get a tax deduction, so I need a DTL. Okay. And then down the road, when I don't get my tax deduction, I'll debit my DTL and I'll credit my payable. Meaning that I'll owe more tax than my book income would suggest. My book expense will imply that I save tax, I get a deduction. But in fact, I don't. I already deducted. So I'll need to reverse my D DTL 
anticipating that I have a bad guy and then reflect the payable because I owe tax now. Make sense? Okay. So, for some of you, when you don't understand the facts, definitely take time to understand what are the book and tax consequences. Otherwise, the provision is not going to make any sense, right? I mean, the provision step one, two, and three is all predicated on the difference between the book accounting and the tax treatment. So, without a doubt, you got to get set on those two things, right? You got to understand what's happening in the books, understand what happens on your return, because until you got those two things clear in your mind, your odds of getting the rest of it right are not good. Yeah? And don't be shy. Ask questions. Um, me or Anna or Quinn, any of us, your neighbors, right? Okay, good. Okay. All right, so we, um, we're working our way through identifying perms and temps, and we're kind of focusing on the current payable or receivable. Um, so in the next section, we're going to hit sections two and three, okay? And I feel like we've kind of covered this in a f to a fair degree already. Um, but let me just kind of pause here. How are you guys feeling about perms versus temps? Like if I just rattled off a bunch of items, how good do you feel about perms and temps? Is anyone feeling not good that wants to raise their hand? Not good. Um, one thing that we have, don't we have some like basic training materials for staff in the office around compliance and book tax differences? Do you know if they call out perms versus temps? Yeah. If you can pull that up, maybe we can circulate the, that to class if you look at it and if you think it's helpful. So there's something that we give um, folks in the office that explain common types of book tax differences. So maybe we'll circulate that. And if that distinguishes perm and temp items, we'll circulate that around to you guys. OK. OK. Um, so again, step two, looking at this slide, step two is really just the equivalent of doing a tax return, calculating your tax liability. right? So. For some of you who have work experience but not provision experience per se, step two generally comes pretty naturally. And then step three, like I touched on briefly, is you know you, you, you calculated what you thought your tax liability was at the provision, and it turned out to be a little off. So you got to true it up. You got to figure out what your differences were, and then essentially do your provision again with the correct numbers, right? And fix what you did before. That's all that true up is. We'll, we'll touch on that again in a second in a slide here. Okay. So in the sequence of things, in theory, we, we've gotten comfortable with what's a perm and what's a temporary difference. And so now we're going to focus on computing the current provision. Okay, so this schedule, this should look like a tax return. You start with book income. You make your adjustments for perm and temp items. You subtract NOLs, so at some point, at some point in here, we'll get, we'll, we'll start including NOLs in our provision calculations, so you understand how to how to accrue or account for an NOL. But we're not there yet. We multiply by the tax rate and we take out credits, right? We had that credited example earlier, and we get our net current liability. So think tax return when you think current liability. Okay. All right. So here's a problem. <clears throat> I think I'm going to go through this pretty quickly since, uh, in my mind, we're running low on time. So company has a million dollars of income, tax rate of 35 percent and a state rate of 7. So this will be the first time you're slightly introduced to the concept of a separate state rate. Okay? We're not going to go like full bore on this thing, but you'll see how it plays into things in a bit. So if we were trying to compute the company's current income tax expense 
right? We list off a bunch of facts here. So depreciation, tax depreciation is bigger than books. That means we're going to get a favorable reduction in our current liability. $10,000 of our meals and entertainment is not deductible. There's 50,000 of inventory adjustments, which means the tax deduction for inventory is slower than books. Right, so we have more taxable income than book income because of the difference in methods of accounting for inventory. Fines and penalties are non-deductible, so our taxable income is higher. Section 199 deduction, who knows what that is? That was in the feud. Bella, what's the Section 199 deduction? Um, manufacturing. manufacturing deduction. So if you're a manufacturer, you make stuff, you sell it at a profit, um, and you generally make it in the U.S., the government says, hey, that's a good thing for our economy. We want more people to make stuff and make a profit and make it in the U.S. So if you do those things, we'll give you a deduction and reduce your tax bill. So keep doing what you're doing because that's good for everybody. So the 199 deduction is a permanent deduction you get to reduce your taxable income because you're doing something the government likes you to do. That fourteen thousand dollars of permanent deduction. Forty-five thousand of bad debt reserves. So those aren't deductible until we write off the accounts receivable. So that's a temporary addback. And bonuses accrued but not paid. We can't deduct a bonus until it's paid. Simplistically. So. That $30,000 is going to be an add back to taxable income and it'll be deductible in the future. It's a temp item. Okay. So, in the next slide, I'm going to flip to the answer. But if we were just computing taxable income, we would use a sheet like this. All right? We'd start with book income, we'd make adjustments for our book tax differences. We'd apply our tax rate to the taxable income, and out comes our tax expense. The one thing I'll draw your attention to is this item here, which is our federal taxable income after our state tax deduction. So this is interesting because state tax deduction. Right, we didn't talk about, when we were on this page, we didn't talk about our state tax deduction in that list at the bottom of the page. Right? So how does that, so, okay, so Eugene, you are a resident state expert. <laughs> Although this is really a federal issue. But how does, the, how does the federal deduction for state taxes work? What is that all about? So the federal deductions um, at the state level have to be at back to So... Uh, okay, so let me phrase that differently. So, who files an individual income tax return? <laughs> Let's say it, man. You guys are all getting us. Um, okay, so, Jose. So, when you um, file your individual tax return, uh, are you deducting, are you claiming on your federal return a deduction for the state taxes you pay? Assuming you don't file a standard deduction. So you claim a federal deduction for the state taxes you pay. Okay. That is true for corporations too. Right? So just like an individual says, I pay $100 to the state of California because I live here and I pay state tax, and the federal government allows you to deduct that 100 the same is true for corporations. So if they pay st state tax, it's deductible for federal purposes. Okay. Sometimes the deduction is allowed in a, on a current basis, meaning, like, let's say we're in 2013, and on our state returns for 2013, we pay 100. If we're on a current basis, or a current method, that means for federal in 2013, we would deduct the 100. So we would take the deduction in the same year we pay the state tax. In some states, we are required to be on a lag method. So if you pay $100 of state tax, in 2013, you get to deduct it in 14. So that's how California taxes work, for example. Okay. 
So we're going to assume that we're on a current method for this example. Okay. But the tricky thing about this problem is, in order to determine what your federal deduction for state taxes is, you have to actually calculate what your state tax is, right? Because we didn't tell you other than to say that the rate was 7%. Right? So, this is one of those, I'll show you the answer and it'll seem really easy, but if you did it yourself, it might not be so straightforward. So, we're starting with um, profit before tax. And one of the things I'll point out is that uh, we're going kind of quickly through the facts, but if you remember, the facts started with a million of income. So if you look at the first line of the facts, but in that parenthetical right below it, it said that million was net of tax expense of 300000 Well, we want to start with pre-tax income. We don't want to start our taxable income with after tax. I mean, that's circular. So we want to start with pre-tax. So the pre-tax equivalent would be 1.3, which is why we start on this page with the 1.3. Okay. So then the next thing we do is we go through our perm and temp differences. All right, we go through perm and temp differences to get to our calif or our state taxable income. So notice we're doing state first. And we calculate our state tax, okay? So this is the state tax we expect to pay. Okay, why do we calculate state first before federal? That seems counterintuitive, right? Because normally you do federal first. At least when you file tax returns, you do federal first and then you do state returns. Right, so Way says you get a federal deduction for state tax, so you got to figure out the state first so you know how to even do your federal. You can't do your federal until you know your state tax. So you might as well do state tax before federal. Right? Right. So we calculate our state tax of 94000 and then in order to get to our federal income, we take state taxable income, this is the only thing, we take our state taxable income of this number, subtract the 94000 because we're going to get a deduction for the 94000 and that is this number, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so our federal tax liability will be this guy. And then this will be our total. Okay, so one of the first moments of like severe frustration in this course when you start going through examples is how do I account for... Um, how do I account for the fact that I get a federal deduction for my state taxes? That starts to get harder, especially when you're on a lag method. Here where it's current, it's not that hard. But when you're on a lag method, doing the provision calculations is pretty messy. Yeah. Okay, so that, again, I, we're kind of starting with baby steps here, but in terms of calculating the current liability, that's what we're going to look for, is a calculation that looks like that. Start with book income, adjust for permanent temps, taxable income, tax rate, credits, tax. Okay? Okay, return to accrual differences. So I gave you a simple example of this on the very front end of, um, of tonight when we were going through um, those freehand notes. So return to accrual differences are, we do our provision, we estimate to the best extent we can what our perms are, what our temps are, we accrue our payable, we set up our deferreds, but inevitably it's not right. So we need to come in when we file our return and true everything up that we booked before. Right? If our payable was a little low, we need to accrue more payable. If our deferreds were a little too high, we need to reduce our deferreds. Right? We need to take all the balances we computed at year end and fix them. 
right? But in a way, it's just another step one, two, three entry on top of what we did at your end, right? Or if you want to look at it as, gosh, I'll start all over again. I'll do my provision completely from the beginning with all the right numbers based on my return. And then I'll compare it to what I booked before. That difference, that's your return to accrual difference. Okay. So for those of you working and having any role in a provision, this is always the question when you're dealing with return to accrual differences, whether it's a change in an estimate or an error. Okay, so why do we care? Who knows? Nelly, why do we care? Why do the provision people at Oracle care whether their true ups are estimates or errors? Why, why do they care? Let's say you had a big, big miss. You completely forgot you got a 199 deduction. Like it didn't even occur to you at the provision. And then when you filed your return, the smart people doing the return said, yeah, we get this huge 199 deduction because we make stuff and we make it at a profit and the government loves that. So voila, big deduction. Okay. So if we were booking a true up entry in that case, we're going to debit our payable because our payable was too high at the provision, right? We completely missed the fact we got this huge deduction. And so when we realized it, we, we said, oh, our payable is too high. We don't owe that much. We got to debit our payable. And because that's a perm item, we get to credit our provision. And so this is great, right? We got a credit to provision. We got a credit to income, more earnings. Everyone's happy, right? But let's say it's huge, right? Huge for Oracle even. So the next question somebody's going to ask is, hey, was that difference between the provision and the return, was that a change in estimate or was that an error? I'm going to go with no on that one. But good try. Is it because they need to make a note? So when, a, when an investor reads your financial statements from the prior year, in theory, they looked at it and said, hey, looks like you owe a lot of tax. And if you believe an investor would actually act on that and make an investment decision on the fact that you had a certain tax liability, then you put out your financial statements, you told them like how much your company was worth, what your equity was, and then if you were wrong, like if you just missed 199 and you just made a simple error, arguably you misled that investor, right? Like in hindsight, you wish you would have told the investor, hey, I didn't really owe that much tax. My, my equity, my net worth was a lot higher. I just missed this benefit that I should have booked in my financial statements. And if you med, misled an investor significantly enough, then you have to go back and restate your financial statements. And if you restate your financial statements, um, that's not good, right? Because if you're a company that issues their financial statements and says, oh no, forget those financial statements, here's another financial statement, these are the ones, <laughs> right? I mean, you know what happens in every other aspect of life when that happens. If nothing else, you start not even believing that company. You're like, now I don't even know if you know what you're doing, right? Especially if in the financial statements that are restated, you say, hey, I missed this giant tax benefit I didn't even realize I got, and I'm going to reflect the fact I get that. Right? So most investors are going to be like, hey, what's up with the tax people? Right? So you don't want to restate um, because of all the public perception issues. And also, I mean, public companies are subject to Sarbanes-Oxley. And so if you have a large restatement, um, it's usually because you had some kind of lapse in your controls. Right? And if you had a lapse in your controls that's material enough to cause a restatement, it's probably a big enough lapse in controls that'll get you in trouble if you're the tax people, right? So if your control lapse is big enough, you get a material weakness. 
which basically says your controls aren't good enough to stop a material error. So if you were Oracle and you missed a 199 deduction, I can't imagine that that's not material. And if you didn't have the controls in place to have somebody in the process say, hey, what about the 199 deduction? We don't want to forget that. If you didn't have that control, then you might end up with a material weakness. And when you have a material weakness, you have to say in your financial statements, my controls aren't very good and I'm susceptible to material errors. Which if you're the person in charge of the provision, is like, find another job, right? That is not good. Um, so you can ask our guest speaker next week all about getting a material weakness and whether that's something she's looking forward to, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure Lee lived her life in fear of getting material weakness. So, um, so you don't want it to be an error because once you've described something as an error, it, there's a possible restatement issue. Once you describe something as an error, there's a possible controls issue. All these things start kind of rearing their ugly heads and you don't want any of those things. So what you would prefer um, but this is not elective, it just is what it is. What you would prefer is to say, gosh, I estimated at the provision and my estimates slightly changed because I got better information over time, right? And the line between I missed the fact I got a 199 deduction and, you know, I just, I, my, my thinking on the issue evolved and I have this kind of slightly new take on things, right? That might seem nuanced, but that's a, that's a kind of a line that a lot of people have whenever they have a significant return to accrual adjustment, right? They're always having that conversation of, is this an error versus change in estimate? Okay. But if it's a change in estimate, then you say, well, there's no restatement. I mean, I didn't even know this stuff back then. There's nothing to correct. I'm just updating you now based on what I know now. So there's no point in having to go backwards. But if it's an error, the first thought you have to, to process is, what would things look like if I went back and fixed it? Would anybody care? Would it be material? Does it matter? What periods would have affected? And trust me, when you have an, an error, it's, uh, it's not fun. A lot of people get involved. Right? It's like a police stop when not just like one car stops, there's like three other cars for backup. You know, that's what happens when there's an error. Okay? All right. You don't care so much about that as you just care about getting the provision right, but that's just <laughs> context. Okay, so in our simple example, if we did the provision, we're doing the provision, and we said, man, we thought there was a 200 add back for penalties, but in reality, there was only 130 add back. And this is per our tax return. And we thought there was going to be 100 of add back for meals and entertainment, but actually it was lower. So we overestimated on both fronts. And so this $100 difference, that's a good guy. Meaning we didn't pay as much tax as we thought we were going to pay. So that means we need to reduce our payable, and we get a provision benefit. Right? But all we're doing is comparing what we thought to what ultimately became. And we're taking that difference and taking the balances we calculated before and fixing them. That simple. All right? Okay, same thing works for temp. So I have four temps here. And I thought I was going to get a net deduction on my return of 370, but in fact I got a net deduction of 720. So I got a bigger tax return deduction. That means my payable went down. But because these are all temp items, it's just going to reverse. It means my payable is going to go up in the future, which means my deferred liabilities go up. Okay? And here I've shown the current and deferred expense separately, but if I was worried about total expense, I would just get rid of these guys and say all that's really happening is 
for the moment, the tax I owe now is going down, but that's just simply going to turn around on me later. Okay? So you can have a return to accrual difference for perm items, which drives the provision, or you can have a return to accrual difference for temp items, which would just have the effect of moving the numbers between those first two steps. How much tax do I owe now versus how much tax will I pay or save in the future? So if you thought of that kind of three-column journal entry schedule we've been going through, all this would do is move the numbers between the first two columns. Right? Just a reclass yeah, people will say it's a balance sheet reclass, right? Um, it's rate neutral. And in theory, there's less pressure on that because people tend to focus less on what the balance sheet says and focus more on what the income statement says. Okay, we already talked about change in estimates versus error. You got the editorialized version. So here's some accounting rules that apply when you deal with that. So when you go to work and you're doing the provision and you screw it up and you miss something big, you might want to pull this slide out and determine whether you had a change in estimate or an error. But you won't care about this until you make the mistake and then you'll be in a panic looking for what the rules are. Remember, next week when Lee's here, you have to ask her about the errors she's made and whether anything has ever been an error versus always a change in estimate. Okay, return to accrual differences. Feel like you got that? Catherine? Yeah, that's a good question. So when are they booked? Um, almost always they're booked when the returns are filed because that's kind of the moment you have clarity over what the, the new facts are. In theory, you could book them any time you learn whatever the information is where... You know, let's say you're in April and you're just starting a return, but you already identify something, you know the difference. You could book that then. But most companies book those true-ups when they file their return. But if, like, let's take our Oracle example. Oracle is a May year-end. Their return is not due till uh, February 15th, I think. So if they discover in September, they're like, oh, my gosh, we forgot our 199 deduction. They probably wouldn't wait until you know, February to book their return to accrual difference. Like, that would be so major that they would book it as soon as they found out and go through that whole error discussion. That makes sense? Okay. Nina? So, like, uh, if the Um, so Mina's question is, if you had a return to accrual difference like this for temp items, do you still have the error versus change in estimate conversation? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, if you, if you misstated the balance sheet sufficiently, in theory, an investor would be freaked out by that. Um, as you might guess, you'd have to really misstate it for somebody to probably hit the panic button on like an oracle. Because... I'm sure most investors are like, okay, I'm pretty sure the balance sheet is like a ton of cash and a ton of equity, right? So whatever you're going to do on the tax balances is probably not going to sway an investor. And that comes into account when you're dealing with how to deal with these errors. Um, but yeah, you can have error versus estimate conversations regardless of if it's temper perm. Okay, we're already on to step four. Man, this class is almost over. Step four, the deferred provision. Okay, so some of you have already said, I understand how to calculate the tax liability. I got the first entry, but man, when the deferreds hit, like everything falls apart for me, right? And that's just because it's probably a f new concept, right? That's what it comes down to. So deferred taxes. Deferred taxes, deferred tax liabilities. The first thing we got to identify is temporary differences. So the temporary differences in kind of ASC 740 terminology is the pre-tax amount of a timing item, right? So if somebody says, I have a temp item, think of that as the pre-tax number, right? I have a $100 depreciation difference because I claimed $100 of tax depreciation that was greater than books. 
that's a temp item. And, in, and more specifically, it's a taxable temp item because in the future, that difference will become taxable to you. It'll create tax. When you hear terminology like deferred tax assets or deferred tax liabilities, that's the tax effect. Okay? So if somebody says, I have a $100 depreciation difference and I claimed more tax depreciation than books, you would say that 100 is a taxable temporary difference and it will give rise to $35 of deferred tax liabilities. Okay, we got we good with the language difference? Okay, temp item pre-tax, deferred taxes, tax affected. Deferred tax liabilities mean if you took the underlying item for um, the book balance, whether it's a book asset or book liability, if you turned it into cash, think, would I have a taxable gain or would I have a taxable deduction? If you have a taxable gain, that means the temp difference is a taxable temp difference. If you converted the asset to cash and you'd have a tax loss, that means you have a deductible temporary difference. Okay? Deductible temporary differences will give rise to DTAs. You'll save future tax. Taxable temp items will give rise to future tax, which means they're deferred tax liability. All right, so which, which one of these is depreciation going to be? Is it going to be a deferred tax liability or a deferred tax asset? Sam, what do you think? I can't hear you. Okay, so the key part of your answer was usually, right? So it can be both. So it depends, right? What's an NOL going to be? I mean, was a NOL going to be a uh, deferred tax asset or a liability? Yeah, everyone helped you out there. It's a deferred tax asset, right? You're going to save future tax. Um, okay. You good with that? So anyone remember what Disney's big deferred tax assets and liabilities were? Just flip to their 10K here while we're talking. All right, so we got this table in their 10K, right? So. One of the interesting things about their 10K is the numbers are all crazy. Meaning, they, they list deferred tax assets with brackets. I don't think I've ever seen another company do that. I mean, a deferred tax asset, if you're showing it in debit credit form, is not bracketed. And then usually if you're just showing something in absolute form, I mean, this is a positive number. I don't have a negative deferred asset. So it's interesting. I don't think I've, I, as you look at other 10Ks throughout the course, I would challenge you to find one that does it like this. I don't think anyone does. But anyways, um, they follow, for the most part, what the prescribed presentation is, and they list the deferred assets first, and they list the deferred liabilities next. So their big deferred assets are accrued liabilities. So that means they're accruing stuff for book purposes but they can't deduct it in, in, until a later point in time, right? So in the future, something will happen when they pay those liabilities and you'll get a deduction. That's what that's saying. Some of these other guys, these are tricky. Um, foreign subsidiaries, they have a deferred asset of $579 million for foreign subsidiaries. So we're not going to go into that. Well, that's the last class. Um, Equity-based comp, that's class five. That's where you're going to get mad. Um, this non-controlling interest in NOLs thing, that's really confusing. So this section of the, of the presentation is pretty complex, right? You look at those, and it doesn't look like warranty reserve and bad debt reserve. I mean, that's all buried in accrued liabilities. They probably got a bunch of those things. But when you look at those other individual items, that seems kind of confusing, right? If you had to explain to your neighbor right now what the 
non-controlling interest net of well is, that doesn't exactly just make a light go off, right? And the deferred liabilities, so depreciation, so like Sam was saying, depreciation tends to be a um, DTL, and it's usually because, especially in the last like 10 years where there's been a lot of bonus depreciation, the U.S. rules allow you to quickly depreciate assets, whereas books is taking their time. And you can see on a relative magnitude basis that that those accruals and the depreciation dwarf everything else, right? And that kind of that might be consistent with other companies when you look at their deferreds. They could have some big ones that dominate the the, the picture. Okay, so deferred assets and liabilities. Okay. So if we were thinking of book and tax basis, actually, book and tax basis. So remember what I did when we were free-forming that example and I showed you the depreciation and then I proved the deferred by comparing the net book value of the asset to the net tax value? That's what, that's what is meant when we say we're comparing book and tax basis. So if I'm saying I had a truck, my earlier example... Excuse me. Um, my earlier example was I had a truck, and my book basis was ten thousand minus three thousand, meaning my net book value was seven thousand, and my tax basis was ten thousand minus twenty eight hundred, or seventy two hundred. That difference. That's my book of 7,000 basis versus my tax of 7,200. That difference, because tax is greater than books, that's a deductible difference. Okay? So with timing differences, not only should you be able to look at whatever the adjustment is in the current calc and say, oh, that thing must flip down the road, you should also be able to look at your ending deferred and prove it this way. Okay? So whatever you calculate as your ending temporary difference that will drive a deferred balance, you should be able to take the book balance and tax balance of, of an asset or basis and compare them. The same thing is true outside of depreciation. So if you had prepaid insurance, for books you have a basis, you have an asset sitting on the balance sheet. For tax, you already deducted that thing. So the difference is the entire amount that's recorded for books. If you had a bad debt reserve, there's a book basis you have in accounts receivable, which is net of the reserve, and the tax basis in accounts receivable is gross of the reserve because the reserve doesn't count for tax. So anytime you're looking at a balance sheet, you can go through the different accounts, accounts receivable, inventory, equipment, land, intangibles, whatever, and you should be able to identify that there's a book and tax basis difference those things will all give rise to deferred tax assets or liabilities. Okay? So don't rely, I mean, this class is, will kid you a little bit because we don't do enough multi-year examples, but don't think you can just roll forward what you had last year with the current difference. I mean, that doesn't work. You, you got to prove that what you did cumulatively makes sense with this basis difference. That's super important. Back when SOX first came into being, one of the most basic problems people had was every year that there was a book tax difference on their return for something like depreciation, they would just stick that into their deferreds. And then the next year they would stick it in, the next year. And then suddenly somebody's like, hey, can you prove that ending deferred balance? And they're like, no, I can't prove that. <laughs> right? And mathematically it should work fine, but it just doesn't. You know, things are messy. Companies are big. A lot of things are going in and out. And then all of a sudden, you have this balance that you've been carrying forward for years and years, and you don't even know what it is anymore. Well, one of my clients, um, this is like seven, eight, nine years ago, I remember on their table of deferreds, they had this long listing of deferreds, and one of the deferreds was a negative foreign tax credit carry forward. And I was like, what is that? And they're like, oh, it's been there for years. I'm all, that doesn't mean, <laughs> well, that usually means it's wrong, <laughs> right? 
And yeah, nobody knew what it was, but somehow it just built and we go back into many years and try to understand how it how it got created and I'm sure it made sense to somebody at some point, but if you just kinda of stopped and thought, Well what could that even be? Like how is that even possible? You know, it's not really. Um Okay. So we're on to example two, which I don't actually think is a great example. So I think we might pass on example two. And um, I think we're going to do one of two things with our remaining time. So I kind of want to spend a few more minutes going through the Disney 10K. So I think we're going to do that now. And then um, with the time we have left after that, I think we'll just freeform some examples if that's, if that's helpful to you guys. Otherwise, we can skip out. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording.